and I've been, been involved in gardening, commercial dairy farming, and been canning off and on since 1978. This information, just to give you a, a heads up here, is not all inclusive, but it should get you started again on your, this is just a reminder, refresher, to get you started again on your journey for food preservation. It's very important to learn how to, uh, if you don't know how, to get going with it, and then if you do know how, you're, this is just gonna be a refresher. So you're gonna be maybe doing things if that, if you've done it for years and years, you may have, have a different way of doing it, and that's all right, be your kitchen, your rules. And so this is just coming from my kitchen and some things that I have learned online, internet, through a book and several different other uh, methods and websites, homestead and websites and things like that. Basically, remember to use whatever it is you have. If you do not have a canner, you don't have the money to buy a canner, you don't have to have a canner. You can do water bath, which I'm gonna talk more about water bath uh, shortly too. And canning and water bath is basically what we're going to uh, uh, cover tonight again. And basically, the reason why to do it is because that this day and time where we have food preservation, we know how to do it, but we don't have a supply chain that's maybe keeping up with, and you know, you hear a lot of rumblings around and people saying everything's okay, and you kind of think, well, I don't know about that, it may not be. So it's just a good idea to learn how to do different things, to very uh, learn new things if you need the new things or pick up where you left off in the past. You can do this. Just start again if that that you've been canning for a long time. Just start. So we're going to look at around uh, number seventy-two. That's where we are tonight. We we went and, and ended, I believe, with a paraffin seal. Uh, last week we talked about jars, lids, rings, and a brief, brief overview of what dry canning, pressure can canning, and water bath canning was in raw pack. And this week I hope to continue on that journey. And to get into it a little deeper, I've also brought you some of the recipes I have done. Um, so right now, let's talk some more about pressure canning. We're on number uh, 72 here. So hold on just one second. All right, pressure canner. It's just a large aluminum pot with a lid that seals with either screws or a rubber gasket. A lot of the pressure canners, this is a pressure canner. This is just a Miro pressure canner. And it's an older one, but still it's good. You'll find, you'll run across older pressure canners. And this is the gasket, it's a rubber gasket. See this? So basically your rubber gasket, if it comes with a rubber gasket, which this one does, and if you'll look at the lid of the pressure canner and you'll look and see a place here, this is where the rubber gasket goes and you can feel it. Otherwise, you'll see pressure canners and they'll fit on and it'll have some screws up here. So basically you'll see either the, the kind that fits on with the screw or the kind that basically fits on with the gasket. The one that fits on with the screws, you will pull the screw up and then bolt them down, basically screw them down like that and there'll be like 10 of them, you know, like so. If you have one of those, make sure you're this side, this side, this side, this side, basically just directly across from each other so you screw it down. The ones that are like that, a lot of them are your older ones or your newer ones that are called All-American. All-Americans are pretty pricey, but they're really nice and you can hand them down if you wanted to, pass them down. People have passed them, those down to families, through the family. But this one, this one, like I said, is just an older canner, but it's a good one. This is what I used to can with like in 19, around 1978. Not exactly because that I sold the one that I had and this is another one. But remember, the you don't set your jars right directly on the bottom of the canner. They'll all have something like this, but don't fear if that they don't have one. What you do is you can buy these most anywhere or you can buy them off of Amazon. So measure the inside of the pot 
and get you one if it doesn't have one of these, no big deal. <clears throat> this goes down in the bottom and basically you put enough jars in here. These are pint jars. So what I do, and it's a quick way of, of making sure, figure out how much water is in there. I look, if I've got a ball jar, I look for the A. So I just fill it up. I don't care if it's a quart or a pint. Wherever the bottom of that A is, that's how much water I put, and it's not failed me yet. It's just an easy way of doing it. Or you can do it, you can do it by, uh, if you want to be, uh, easy way to do it and you want to measure it out each time you can do that no problem just read the instructions in your canner and it says if it says three inches of water take you a, a spoon like the regular wooden spoon mark the three inches mark three inches with just a marker and then that way when you put your jars in there you'll know how much water is in there or whether it's an empty canner but that's an easy way to do it and when you're canning, you want things easy. Don't try to overcomplicate. Don't try to make it hard because if you do, you'll make yourself crazy and you will not want to do it. This is not rocket science. It's just canning. Even though it feels like that this is, this is I can't do this. This is just too much. It's not. Trust me. Just, just, you, you just have to, once you do it the first time, read your instructions, write down some instructions or whatever, and then that way go ahead and, and once you do it the first time, then it, it will feel like it's just like doing anything new. Just get started, do it. And then if you mess your stuff up, whatever that it is, you think you don't want to eat it. Generally, when people first start canning some, something, whatever it is they can, they're afraid of it. It's like, I know that that's not good. I know there's something wrong with that. And if you find one or two that something is wrong with the batch, maybe one or two jars, don't throw out the whole thing. Because you generally what it is, you may have something like food particle that's hung in, in between the uh, in between the lid, the lid and the rim of the jar, or you may have a little crack, some kind of something that's gone wrong. But remember. You want to know how you know they've canned? And where's that other one that you don't know what it is? It just sounds weird to give you an idea. You hear that? <laughs> that one is suspect. That's still okay. But you can tell that one is just not good. A lot of people say, well, what you need to do is just pull them up like this. You can still have false seals. They still will fall, they will do a false seal because the air in the jar expands and contracts when they're either, they either have heat or they're cold. So that's the reason why that you may pick it up and it feels like it's okay, but it's not. So just kind of, just take something You can figure it out like that. But don't be afraid of them. If that something is not right, it's not the whole batch generally that's not right. It's just maybe one or two cans, whichever ones. So look at it. Looks good. So I would open it up. And open these jars, by the way, an easy way where you can save the lids is that, what did I do with my knife? Right here. Regular butter knife. See, this is just one of those regular, like, pop the top off of a bottle. But basically what you do is you lay this here. The flat side is towards this. And all you have to do is put this under here. And this, this part right here is on that. And that way you can go ahead and just pop the top off. It works every time and it doesn't bend your jar. So instead of like having to worry about what am I going to do or how am I going to get that off, this is a real easy way to do it. I can't do it any other way besides something like that. I've tried a lot of different ways and it's hard for me. I don't have enough strength in my hands, I guess, but that's easy for me. doesn't bend the jar. Also, here we, here we are now, pounds of pressure. 
This is important. This relates to pounds of pressure needed to safely pressure can and is, and is recipes determined by the elevation above the sea level at the location the canning is taking place. This can be found by searching the internet for correct elevation at your location and consulting the ball canning book or internet. After you find your elevation, the recommended pounds of pressure won't change no matter what you can. And I found this, but I'm not for sure, so that's something you may want to go ahead and look into. I know that I can at 10 pounds of pressure, and that's my that's standard for me because I'm not, I'm at a normal elevation. So you want, you want to check to see what your elevation is. It's either 10 or 15 pounds of pressure, and it's sometimes, actually, if you're at a higher eleva elevation, it changes your... Uh, pounds of pressure and it also will lengthen your time if you're at a higher ele elevation I do believe so check into that constant pressure pressure must remain consistent throughout the canning cycle pressure is raised by increasing heat decreasing heat lowers the pressure now how you tell that is through a jiggler I'm on number 75 now this is like right here this canner remember here's the canner here's the lid Put the gasket on, and it just goes right in, and it's got a little place where it fits. See, it's seated now. So what I'll do, this is this one fits a little bit loose. It's not a big deal, but just to let you know it does fit loose. Usually they fit tighter than this. So what I do is kind of watch what I'm doing and put this thing on. And see it goes on sideways. And you see that I've done it wrong here. See it won't go. Don't get tore up. We've just put it the wrong way. So we come at it this way, okay? The seal fell. Yeah. All right, hold on. See sometimes it's rock it is rocket science. <laughs> All right. Now, I can't remember which way that I did it, but anyway. Okay, never mind. There it goes. Nope, that's the wrong way. All right. Now, so you see it locked on right here. And you got to have it locked on. That's how it works. Locks on. So... There's actually a little place in here that when that it reaches the pressure, there's something that will drop down in this handle and it will hold it. So you will not be able, once it reaches the pressure, you can't do that. This is telling you right now that there's no pressure in there. All right. The Mira, Mira this is an old Miramatic. So this is old Miramatic or Miro, M I. M I R R O pressure canner and they come with this is the jiggler so it actually has marked on here 5 10 and 15 so I will turn it around to 10 and say for instance now what you got to do with the pressure canner you've got to have it where that it vents and you're gonna when you put it on heat and you got it all loaded I've got the can I've got the jars in there and you really need to make a list, in other words, and check off until you get used to doing it. In other words, put the, can, put the jars in, put the water in, put the uh, vent for 10 minutes, and that you need to time that because you don't want it really to go over 10 minutes or whatever, but 10 minutes is supposed to get out any kind of air bubbles that maybe have built up in this pressure canner. So what you're doing is you're having everything work really good for 10 minutes, and it's called venting. I didn't know anything about venting when I first started canning. It's a recent thing, so if you don't vent, don't, don't vent. You know, your kitchen, your rules again. But the USDA and the modern pressure canners uh, say that you need to vent your pressure canner. So basically, you'll know it, and it'll go and you'll have like a... Sh a steady stream of steam coming up out of this right here, this pitcock, okay? 
That's how you know that it's venting. First, it'll start spitting. That's not a good vent. After it starts spitting, it'll kind of do a little bit, and you'll say, oh, yeah, it's steaming. No, it's not. When it comes that steady stream of steam, you'll be able to know it. So that's when you start can uh, timing it. Just time about 10 minutes. If it's 7, okay, whatever. But, you know, try to just make sure that it comes out good. And that way you know everything about your canner is working good, too. So after it's steaming, now very carefully put this on. What this one does is that it jiggles. And on your, on your canner, it will say jiggles, you know, it's supposed to three times a minute or whatever. So this whole thing right here is one jiggle. And then it quits. And then you'll know, and it'll start up again. And it's not just, that's a jiggle, that's not a jiggle. This is a jiggle. So don't get tore up and not know what they're talking about when they start talking about jiggling for three times a minute. Basically, it does that, and then and there's a break. That's your first jiggle. Then it does it again, your second jiggle, and then there, there's a break in it, and then your third jiggle. So basically, you do that. If it gets to going too fast like this right here and starts to come off, and it'll do like that, and it'll go, Shh, don't get tore up. Like I do. <laughs> you take your spoon, your trusty, dandy, everybody needs a wooden spoon, and do. And even if it does fall off, the worst thing that can happen, you remember all it is is venting pressure, okay? So it'll go again. So then all you have to do is just put it on, okay? So it's not a big deal. Don't get tore up about it. <laughs> Because it has happened to me, and if it's got too much steam or too much pressure, that's what it'll do. It'll just come off right here. Now, if it gets too hot, all of the pressure canners have a little button here. It's a, called a pressure release valve. So you pick this canner up, and you see that? There's, a, there's like a button on here. This is a steel button. Most of the newer ones come with a rubber button. But what that does is that on these type of canners, what it will do is when it start, the pressure starts building up, it goes down. On the other kind, type of canner, which is a, I'm having a moment what it is. But anyway, one of the newer type of canners, it has like something similar to and like they talk about that it has like a place right here and when this goes up and like it's the same way with your power pressure cookers and some of those other things, the electric ones, but you have like a, your pitcock goes up right there and what it's doing is telling you the pressure, y it has reached pressure. This is a pressure release valve. And the one that we're, we're talking about in this particular one, when it reaches pressure, this is hidden. It's right here. So some of the newer ones, this will be up in here. But make sure when you get a canner, do not get one. Well, you can get one, the older ones, but they're, they're, a lot of di uh, they're really different. This one, I like this because that you can hear it jiggle. Now, some of them, they do the hula dance. They do that right there, and it's just a real, it's not any kind of anything like this one I told you, like three jiggles a minute. This is the hula, and what it does is does this back and forth the whole time, and you want it to do a, a nice, gentle hula. If it gets to hula like this right here, then you your pressure is too high, okay? <laughs> so there's two types. Now, another type of pressure canner is some of the older ones, they, they have, uh, they may have, uh, some of the newer ones also have like a gauge. You know what I'm talking about with a gauge? All right, the gauge will have like from zero to what, maybe 25 or something like that, but it'll have like 
zero and then it starts going up and you like the gauge ones you want to do about 10 pounds of pressure too it's just another way to figure out how much pressure that you have that you're running some of them have the gauge and the hula or this either one and which is fine i can the gauge is just something that i really don't watch i rather listen so if you have these, this is the best way, best thing to have is the jiggler. So don't get tore up if you look at the one with the gauge, and the gauge is very expensive, the one with the gauge. You don't have to have the gauge. But if you see an older canner, and it has a gauge, and it doesn't have any place for anything like this, and it has something that looks like it just stands up like this and then bends over, like at the top, I don't know how to describe it, but... That's about the way it looks like. So it straightens up, then it's, it has a uh, bend in it, uh, and it bends over at the top. That is an older one, and what it does is it doesn't have a jiggler or, or anything like that. You must watch the gauge, okay? So if you see one that doesn't have either the jigglers, and it's an older one, you can still get it. You can still get those canners, and you can still like change these things out where that it you, where you have uh, the option to go ahead and just you can order this like this right here online, and you can uh, play you can replace that what I told you that little thing there. You'll know what I'm talking about. Oh, no kidding. I haven't seen one of those, so that's an interesting thing. So they have, there's another different kind. There's all, diff all sorts of different kinds of pressure canners, but basically back in, the ni in ni like 1978 or so, they were called pressure cookers, by the way, and it was safe to can, and e even in the smaller uh, pressure cookers that you could can, as long as it had one of these where that you could change the, you know, 10, 15, and 5 or whatever. But as long as you had a jiggler that you could change the, the weight on, then you were fine with that. So that's just something to keep in mind. So if you see an older one that's marked a pressure cooker, but it's a good size and it looks like a canner, they called them pressure cookers back in the day. They only now call them canners, and they, they, they divide that. So now it's like this is, today by today's standard, this would be a pressure canner. And the older ones are called pressure cooker, and some say pressure cooker slash canner. So just give you an idea. All right, we've looked at, we're down to 79 on parts. Is there any questions about those, the, what we just said, talking about the gauges, gaskets, or anything like that? Uh, Kim, I have a, uh, would anybody like to see up close the way she was removing that, uh, the lid off the jar with that knife, or could everybody see that just fine? Is everybody good with that? Everybody was good with that. They saw that. Are there any other questions? Christine, hold on one second. Let me get you guys the mics. Now, you said that you reuse your lids. You can reuse the lids. Uh, one of the things is, is that uh, what I read is today, and this was something that's just fresh off the press. I looked at uh, somebody that was uh, that had trained with the Amish on uh, some canning, and she said that they reuse the lids, but don't put it on anything that would, in other words, not something expensive, not meats, not something that you, you know, worked and put together. Say, for instance, this beef stew with mushroom. It took a long time to put this together. And it would have hurt my feelings if that I had put a, uh, another lid on it and it had the, the seal had failed. Now, one thing that, they, that is uh, important to know, too, that your, um, 
I probably would not reuse lids unless that I reused them on, and this is just me, you know, the dehydration, but we'll start talking about that or just for like storage of things. But in case of a grid down situation, something happened, and you don't have any lids or like that shortage that we had, uh, basically boil your lids to soften them. Not boil, but simmer. Let me put it another way. Simmer, not boil, but simmer your lids. She said you could actually tell about the lids if that they would be okay or not. And what you wondered maybe what my Pringle, Pringles jar is for. My so I can actually look here and kind of see. See... Some of these lids may look, she said if they looked brittle, like this one has got potential. I can feel the rubber on it. It feels good. In other words, it feels like that it might seal. So basically, the rubber is soft. It's not cracked. And uh, you just basically would simmer that lid, this particular lid. And, until, and what it will do is it will puff up that rubber and you would still be able to probably can with that. But like I said, it would be something if I decided to do that that I really didn't, wasn't worried about, you know, or that could recan, like for instance, pinto beans. Some kind of something, or even preserves, because a lot of times the preserves, like, if, especially if that you have like uh, preserves that are full of sugar, sugar is really your preservatives, your preserver and your, uh, your preserves, you know, or your jams or your jellies, that's what really preserves the, the fruit in it and everything, make where it doesn't spoil. The, this could be actually used for that. So, or just, you know, pickles, be great for pickles. But if it was a grid down situation and I was getting tore up and didn't have any lids, you bet, yeah, I would reuse these lids. Question. Yes. I must have missed something when you were talking about the um, the ten minutes. At, you get the steady steam steam coming out, and then you start timing ten minutes. Oh, the rest of the story. Okay. What? When? When do you have to? When do you start counting the three jiggles a minute after the ten minutes? Once you once it starts, and what how this how this canner would work, and how most of them work is after that steam comes out and you can you uh, time it for 10 minutes then what you do is you go ahead and you put the jiggler on oh then you put it on okay right. you put it on so now it's going to sit there and not do anything for a while because okay. it's going to build back build up the pressure it really had a lot of pressure and it was coming out the top you know this canner did it was everything so you basically just shut off that pressure that, that makes sense. steam coming out so you went, once you put your jiggler on, then you're going to wait until it either hulas okay. or jiggles. Right. And once it starts to once it starts to jiggle or hula, it may just be just a little bit, but you got to let it go ahead and get up to where it's that's doing the hula good, <laughs> or that it's doing that jiggle really good, just like that. And then you start adjusting your heat is what you start doing. If it's really doing all that, you turn your heat down. And I have even, I have even like, and you're not really supposed to, but I have pulled my canner off of that eye just a little bit, let it calm down. But the way to keep that from happening, don't start your canner on high. Do not do it. Because once you... If you, you have your canner and it's like on high, then it's got a ways to come back down. And the thing is about if you don't want to see like, like some kind of siphoning, say this as much as I love it, it's siphoned. Do you see how it did? I had it up to here. This is usually where that you put any kind of like meat or anything like that. You, one inch, one inch is the first ring on a jar. And that's one inch, what they call one inch head space. So what happened is that some of this siphoned out. And the reason why is because that it's not like you need to bring it up. In other words, bring it up easy. Keep it at a level 
the whole time. You don't want it doing all of this. So basically what where my stove works, and you'll find the sweet spot on your stove to too. There's a sweet spot on that stove, and you'll figure it out once you get to canning. But mine is, what I do is I, I've got an electric stove, and I, bring, I just put it on medium-high. And then when it starts to doing all this that it's already done, then I go ahead and start reducing it by increments. I don't reduce it all the way. Some, you can reduce it all the way, but what you're going to do is have something like that. You're going to have to watch it just a little bit in the beginning when you're reducing it and just keep reducing it in increments. And where mine is, is like not, um, it's around just between low and medium is where my sweet spot is. So once I reach, I know that I'm reducing it by increments. And what you do is it, it's doing that just exactly what it's supposed to. And then all of a sudden it starts doing this. It's time to reduce it a little more till it starts doing that again, you know. And then when it starts getting up, acting up a little bit, you'll reduce it a little more. And you keep doing that until you reach that sweet spot of your stove. And once you figure that out, you're going to know right off where that is. So then it's going to, you're not even going to have to really worry about it. You're just going to, you can go ahead and do whatever you want to, paint or, you know, uh, clean up the kitchen or watch TV or whatever you want to do, whatever floats your boat. And, and just listen to it because you're going to be able to hear it, I promise. It's that loud you're going to be able to hear it. And then when it gets, like I said, that sweet spot, you're going to know where it is. And then you're just going to time it. Once it starts, don't do like what I did and forget to start my timer. And then I ended up with these beautiful, nasty eggs. Where are they? There's some, uh, anyway, some eggs in here somewhere, but they're just, like I said, they're just, they're just, anyway, you don't even want to see them. It's probably just as well they're hid. But anyway, always watch, you know, remember the time. And that's what I say. Get you some kind of a checklist or something going just when you start canning, just where that you can do it just like clockwork. After this, this. After this, this. Otherwise, you'll do like I did. Another thing I did is I forgot to add the water to one of my canners. Now, what happens when you when that happens? You'll you'll have steam, but there'll be no there really won't be much steam with it. It'll just be hot air that be doing and and it it really didn't at the very beginning. It did not like smell or anything like that. But they did, there wasn't really steam. You know, steam, you can see steam. And it wasn't steaming. And I was going, I wonder why my canner is not steaming. And you know it's been in there long enough. Well, the next thing I know, it was just, I thought, oh, no. See, and I didn't use a checklist. So what, hap what happens when that, when that happens is like the bottom will bow out. You see, this is a straight bottom on this canner. If you go to buy a used canner, this is what you look for is a straight bottom. But don't get tore up if you don't, if you have one that's warped. And what I mean by warped, it will rock like this. You've had a warped pan, right? Everybody's had a warped pan. You go, what in the world? So what you do, if you have one of those, is you turn it upside down. And this goes for a, like an aluminum pan or whatever, steel pan. And it's best to heat it. You know, go ahead and heat it up on the stove, put a little water in it, heat it up on the stove. And I hate to say, but get a rubber mallet. And you can feel it, too. You can feel if it's warped. You will feel it really easy. You'll go, oh, it's warped. So what I did with that canner is I took a rubber mallet because I read on my friend YouTube how to do that. But took that rubber mallet, kept feeling where that hump was, and I would hit that canner. And what I basically did, I have floor with carpet so it didn't hurt this under the underside. But if you were to do that, just make sure that you have it padded. And then if that it's still there, I heat it just a little bit more and then beat a little more. But after you get through, after I got through, I had it completely flat again. 
and it's, uh, it's flat to this day. So that's how you do it, just in case and you do something like that. Don't get tore up and throw it in the trash. Or if you do, bring it to me. I'll take it. <laughs> All right, let's see where we are now. All right, parts. Number 79, parts. Know your brand and find, to find the no model number, it's usually stamped on the bottom, okay? So this is like when you look here, you can see it says Mira. This is what kind it is. It says Mira, and it's an M-0512 12 quart, okay? So if I go to look for parts like a gasket, you can find these. You can find... If something is wrong with that, you can find that. You can find these handles. And see, they just go on. If you'll look, like this right here is just, there's a screw. There it is. But there's a screw in here, and it just bolts on, do you see? So don't get tore up about if anything breaks on it. Just go on and order a part for whatever that it is. Or if you see a used one or something, a little something's wrong with it pointed it out, said, hey, this handle's broke. Would you give me $20 off? So you might get one, uh, you might get one cheap. But anyway, on 79 of the parts, I've bought uh, parts from PressureCookerOutlet.com, and there's the phone number just in case you need it. All right, 80, brands of pressure cookers. All Americans are expensive. They had gauges, but they will last forever. They screw down no gasket. Near ones have jigglers. Older ones have that bendy part, but you can update the bendy for a jiggler and the parts are readily available. If it doesn't have a jiggler, you'll need to watch the gauge closely. Presto, that's the kind I was talking about. Presto is the one that has the hula, okay? And you, a lot of times, this one is just to a regular pressure cooker that I set on the stove. But the Presto, the one that I have, I actually have a canner that's a Presto and it comes with parts. You remove one part, and it's 15. You remove another part and it's 10. So basically these will look like donuts on stacked, okay? So that's how you'll figure out how many uh, pounds to use on that. Presto is the one also if you've got a glass top stove that will also, uh, they also have uh, the bottoms that will work on a glass top stove without ruining the glass top stove. All right, let's see. The you can get the Prestos at Walmart or most anywhere, and they're excellent. The smaller ones don't have gauges. Like I said, you don't need one. I'd rather not just soon not have one, really. The older Prestos may not have jigglers, and some may uh, screw down, but they're very reliable. Mirror, and that's a mirror canna, canner, and the older ones may have trouble finding gaskets. That's a replacement gasket, and you'll see it doesn't fit exactly right. I need to try to see if I can get a better one. Still, that one works. But what I have to do is once I finally get it seeded down like I should and it doesn't fall out, then I just put it in here and do it around a little bit till I figure out where the, that it's seeded right and you can actually feel it in tail. Just kind of play with it a little bit. All right, let's see. Headspace. Now, number 81. Headspace is just basically... You'll notice I have pint jars. Uh, I, don't, I do some quarts, but most of them I do as pints because if you need, uh, you're going to serve uh, several in a family or whatever, then you can go ahead and dump three. But if it's just for me, here's my jar. So basically, the, this is the first, the first rim here is an inch head space. The next one is a half inch. And that's like a quarter inch. So basically, all you have to do is look right here. But if you want to be technical, they actually have these right here that come in a, like a canning kit. And you see these gaps? It actually will tell you that this is an inch head space. As long as I get it pretty well okay, it's going to turn out pretty good. But just make sure to get it closed. Don't, like if it says... You know, some like thick, thick things are going to expand. So you may need maybe to come up to the shoulder of the jar. Shoulder of the jar is just right here. Just like a regular shoulder on a person right there. See that shoulder? 
So you may want to come down if it's something thick, but really and truly don't can a lot of thick things. Thin it down some because it's going to thicken up in the canner. Once you heat it for a while, it will thicken up. So try not to can something really thick. Thin it down a little bit if you can. And then if you need to, then you can go ahead and thicken it up after you get it out of the can with, you know, flour or cornstarch or something like that. Or sure, uh, not sure gel, but the clear gel. All right. The water bath, if you water bath jams and jellies, they're usually a half to a quarter inch head space. And um, the meats and things like that are usually an inch head space. And anything thicker, it may be a little bit uh, like greater head space. Just it's not going to hurt to go ahead and go a little bit, uh, you know, maybe an inch and a half or something down from the rim of the jar. Just make sure also, make sure to debubble that jar too. Whatever that you can. If you don't, if you see that you have gaps, in other words, even like you uh, put your raw packed chicken, cram that chicken down in that jar, you better take something, and it needs to be uh, this and not this. Don't, don't use this in your jars. The reason why is because you can actually crack or weaken that jar by using metal in it. So just go ahead and use like this thing this is also a debubbler, so you can actually just run this in the sides of the jar, and this is what I'm talking about. Run it through there, and you, what it does is that it scoots everything around, and if there's any kind of liquid or an air bubble in it, it'll get that air bubble out. And then sometimes, even when you do that, do that then you come on down, and it's like all the way down here. When you had it filled up to here, then it goes down here. You go, oh, where, oh, man, oh my, look. So you pour a little bit, of, put a little bit more stuff in there, and fill it all the way up to where it goes. And what happens if you don't do that? Now that may be a reason too that that one jar, instead of siphoning, I don't know what happened to it, but I'm just telling you reasons why something like that would have happened on that soup, wherever it is, right here. It could have been I didn't debubble it too. See, I was in a hurry or something. All right. Now. Siphoning, and we already talked some about siphoning, and that's number 83. If you see a jar that has li liquid missing, it could be due to siphoning. It happens, too, if you tilted the jar, removing it from the canner like this. So it's best always, this is how you pick up a jar. These are jar lifters, and I, I've got my own little way of doing things, and people got their own little way, but this is my way. So I do it just about like that. Pull it up out of that canner, bring it over, set it down on a towel. I usually have towels sitting out because that the towel is easy to wash, easy to fool with. It won't burn your kitchen counter, and it will hold the mess, like, for instance, the spills or anything, because when you're pulling it out sometimes, you know, remember, if something's siphoned, it's not really going to hurt it, but it will be messy, and you, and, and you won't want that on your uh, uh, nice... Uh, counter or whatever you just want it something that's easy to clean up good so I use either regular bath towels I know that sounds crazy but I fold them in two and then that way if I put my I'm putting my jars on that towel I also just kind of take that towel and fold it over some people say oh you'll sour something that if you do it like that but I've never had anything to sour I just rather have it where that it doesn't I've got air conditioner so the air conditioner vents in my kitchen and it blows pretty good. I don't want it cracking my jars. Would hurt my feelings. So uh, it's always a good idea. Now this is how to prevent it. Prevent it too. Gradual ch temperature change, and this is what we talked about before. Is that your friend? It's always a good idea to let the jars rest before removing them from the canner. It can also hap happen by letting the canner come up to heat too quickly and then too hot and cooling down too quickly. So basically, you've got to have a consistent temperature if you can at all, as much as you can. If it's a water bath canner, remember this is the water bath canner. This is a small one, but they also make whatever size you want or that you could just imagine that this is a just a regular pan. This is actually like a spaghetti pan, by the way, pasta pan. This is what this is. 
and it works great for like little pints, you know, for like jellies and everything. So I just put my jars down there. It doesn't rest on the bottom. Put my wa put my water in, lid on. Works great. You can use whatever you want. Remember the, our homemade bottom here. It's just a real easy way to if you don't if you just got a regular stainless steel can, you just fix you something like this or even go ahead and just put this on the bottom. Just put this in there, set your jars in there, pour your water in, still water bath canner. The main thing is you've got to worry about, you see how, where this is? This is not giving me enough room right here because that, that thing that I told you comes up like this. So where's my one inch head space? But pints would work great in it. See, there's your one inch, and you got to have it too where it'll go ahead and boil. And I want to keep my water hard all the time, so I'm going to keep adding water, and I'm going to go over more over the one inch because I do not want them to boil um, and and basically boil down where the water is down to here. See, then it won't. It's not going to work right for you. So. You can kind of tell by if something's going to fit by just setting your jar beside whatever pan you're, you're looking at when you're talking about water bath. So, and it's also a good idea to let the jars rest before removing them from the canner. Once your canner is come, your time, it's everything is timed and your everything is good and you've turned off your stove because that's what you're going to do. You're not going to do anything like run, wa run cold water or cool it off quick because remember it, it's bad for it. So what you're going to do is that you're going to let the jars rest. If it's a water bath canner, you're going to let the jars rest for about five minutes or so before you pull them out. If it's a pressure canner, let the pressure come all the way to zero if you're seeing that gauge. If it's a jiggler, the jiggler is going to quit and there would be no hiss at all. Then you're going to unlock that lid and let it sit on top of the canner for about 15 minutes. And what I do, I unlock it and let it kind of sit on the top. And you're going to see steam coming out, okay? And then I'll do this, like kind of let it sit a little bit more. And then I'll go ahead for about 15 minutes and let it sit. And you're still, it's going to be hot. And your jars are still going to be sitting in here and, you're stuck, and they're still hot, okay? Then you're going to go ahead and then you're going to lift them out. You know, do it in increments is what I'm telling you. You can even leave them overnight. If you had a late night canning session, it's better to go ahead. If you're really tired, go ahead and leave those jars in that canner. It's not going to hurt anything. And take them out the next morning. Don't stress. Like I said, this is not rocket science. And it's better you to be healthy than the jars maybe leak a little bit. All right. Now, we already talked about the shoulder of the jar. Taking the jars out of the canner, and we already talked about how to take them out. Don't tilt them. So just lift them straight up, back down on a towel. Turning the jars upside down, we're on a number 87 now. There are people that actually, when you're, especially like old time recipes, they'll say you need to turn the jar upside down or somebody that's water bathing uh, the vegetables or whatever, you'll hear, or the meats. You need to, after you get done with those cans, you need to turn those things upside down now where they'll seal. And what they'll do is they'll, they'll take them and they'll do them just like this. Some people say not do that. I've done it before. If it's preserves or pickles or something like that, you bet I'll turn them upside down because what I've done basically is just not brought them up to enough heat or anything, and, and it's not going to hurt them to turn them upside down. Basically, you're giving them every chance to go ahead and seal. So that basically negates this little USDA thing pick your jar straight up, pull them right this, this right here. Because if you're going to turn them upside down, I'm just saying. <laughs> like I said, your kitchen, your roofs. It depends on what mood I'm in as to what I do. You know, I follow my roofs pretty well 
uh, straight, but then there's sometimes I may turn the jar upside down. So you may feel have an upside down day too. No, no. When you get ready to take them out, and you're gonna like you're taking this one out right here, especially if it's a jam. So you take it out right here because what you've done is you did you maybe water bath it for ten minutes. Basically, all you're doing is just removing, displacing some of that oxygen and everything, but you're basically sealing the jar because that's not long enough to really can it. So some people go ahead and just turn the jelly jars or whatever upside down like that. Mostly it happens with jams and jellies and pickles where people do that with or something that's pickled. And that's the reason why they would do that. All right. Covering the jars, we already talked about that. I do place a I do place a towel on top, but you can do your kitchen, your rules, you whatever you feel like. Measuring cups, make sure you have some good measuring cups. And one of the things is is these mason jars. What we had talked about before, the mason jars do have measuring cups. These pretty little ones that are smooth ball jars, they have nothing besides like the engraving of ball on the front. I don't like them. I like this pretty little thing right there. Look at there, that fruit. Vegetables and fruit. And then it also has the measurements on the side. That's what I like. But sometimes this is all they have. All right. Use pressure ca canners. And we talked about it being warped. And it tells that, that one number 90, it tells actually how to fix it. So I just put that on there for you. The ball canning book. There's a lady here that's got her mother's ball canning book. I know some of you have one or have have or maybe one that's passed down from your in your family. These are really good and they're basically the standard. They have great recipes in them. Not any kind of rebel canning recipes. This is U these are USDA approved recipes, but it's really great cuz it gives you uh, the ideas on exactly how to do it. I, I highly suggest everyone, if they don't have one, to go get a ball canning book because it will be great to have. Uh, this one, I think it was like $15 or something like that. I think you can still get them for like $15, $15 at Walmart. I saw them the other day. So just like I said, this is well worth your money. I recommend everybody having one. And it's... Uh, it's talking about preserving. So, you know, you got uh, sauces and things like that and meals and problem solvers in here if this pectin is too soft or something like that, you know, you want to know. All right. The another one that I really like is stocking up. And it's just a it's just a book, and it's it's it has a bunch of recipes too. And if you find any good canning books, just always pick them up and read them. It's always good to be familiar. This one is an older one. I bought it because that it's uh, it was like the in nineteen maybe nineteen eighty eight or something like that. So, and it's got your dairy. It's got everything in it. It's got uh, how to dry, how to do other things, how to build a uh, pickles and relishes. Underground storage, it tells you how to build a, like a cellar. You know, it has everything in it if you want to get into it a little bit more. Preparing and storing fish, smoking meats, curing and smoking meats. So this is an invaluable book if you're wanting to get deeper into it and take a, take a bigger bite out of the canning deal. So that's a good one to have. Uh... Uh, Foxfire books. I highly recommend Foxfire. If you can find some, they're collectibles now, I think, but if you can find them on canning or anything, it's, it's very worthwhile. It has a lot of homesteading skills, food preservations, and you can basically find it on eBay. Sure Gel Pectin. Sure Gel. Sure Gel is just basically a brand of pectin, and you use that. It thickens jams, jellies, and preserves. And basically, you can buy it anywhere, basically, basically, basically. And this is what it looks like. I have gone, on, I have gone, up, uh, gone on and taken this out because I store my things like this. I take them out of the box generally, 
and I bought a whole bunch of these at uh, Essex Bargain Hunt. They had them like for 10 or 20 cents a piece, and you better, better believe I was all over it. So that was last fall. So when you find bargains, just go ahead and get them, and I use a vacuum sealer to seal these up, and I sealed a big bunch, and this is one left in this pack right here. But what I do when I seal, there's the instructions. So I, the product and the instructions, and I write down the date that I bought it, so that way I'll know. This is the one where you use a lot of sugar with. So, but if you want to have sure gel and you're a diabetic or you want to cut down on the sugar because sugar is very expensive and right now it's, it's, uh, it's getting, you know, one of those shortage things that we have. So this is actually sure gel and uh, it is low to no sugar. There's a lot of great recipes on the inside that they have, so instead of wondering what kind of recipe you're going to use, just buy one of these boxes. I highly recommend. And look on the recipe, too, uh, as far as, like, your jams and jellies and preserves. There's great recipes in here. Now, you don't have this right here. Not everybody always had this. So where can you get pectin? You know where? You can cut up ap apples. Apples are high in pectin and put them in your preserves, jams, or jellies. So just cut up some apples and it will thicken your jams and jellies. And then do it to taste and see. That's a great way of doing it. Also, an <coughs> excuse me, another way of doing it is uh, using lemon juice. They said lemon juice. So I actually put some lemon juice in and it thickened up my jams and jellies that I was having problems thickening the other day. So they said just add some more lemon juice. The only thing I don't like about lemon juice is it gives a little lemony taste. So if you don't like that, I like the idea of the apples. But basically, the apple peelings have a lot of pectin in it is what I heard. So that's a good idea just in case that you don't have sure gel one of these days. Or sugar, keep on cooking, 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 cooking. You cook it down and cook it like... Uh, cook it like making candy. Basically what you do is you take a big spoon, dip it into that, and then you look at the back of the spoon and run your finger over it, of the back of the spoon. And if it sheets, you know, you're not going to know maybe what sheeting is, but another way of doing this is like dip in that metal spoon. Say this is metal. Dip it in there and run your, it's going to have jam all over it, okay? And then run your finger over here. And if it stays up here and doesn't run on down, then your jam is probably okay and ready. If it keeps on running, and will like when you do this and it run, keeps on running down, then you'll know that it's still too runny. <coughs> mm -hmm. Another way of doing that is like take it like you're uh, cooking some kind of candy and take it and you don't do the ball test. But basically, you pick it up, and it'll just kind of like do a little bit of sheeting. And what that means is it doesn't, it doesn't uh, run, run, run. But basically, you'll see it, and it, it's wide, kind of a wide thing, and it comes down. It's kind of, that works too. Or dipping it into a, like, dipping it into your jam and putting it on a plate and you can tell by how thick it is because the plate will cool. And if you can, if you can kind of do this and, you know, it's still runny or whatever, you pick the plate up and it's still running, bad deal. needs cooking some more. But basically, you don't have to have the pe pectin. It's just a quick way of, of making jelly and jam. All right, let's see here. Clear gel. Clear gel is what you will put like in place of cornstarch or something like that. A lot of people will use the clear gel, and it's basically a cannibal form of cornstarch. It thickens the recipes for canning. It has been said that flour or cornstarch can't be canned successfully. But many rebel canners disagree, and I do too, because that one's made with flour sitting over there, by the way. And that this... And it's this right here is delicious, I'm just telling you, the beef mushroom stew, and I put that in your recipes. But it is delicious, and it has flour in it. 
It also has a little bit of clear gel too. So the no-fill method to measure water, we've already talked about that. If you're using bottle jar jar uh, jars, you just go to the A, okay? Dish pans. Highly recommend when you start canning, you're going to have some kind, you're needing some kind of big bowls and this, that, and the other. So instead of going buying a great big stainless steel bowls and all this, just get you some dish pans. You're going to use those dish pans anyway. If that, if that I, what things, what happen, uh, what happens is what I think your water probably is going to go up along with your other utilities, the electricity is going up. You're probably, your water's probably going up. You know, we're having like a drought situation right now. There are in the west. So the wa way that I do it is I go ahead and when I'm uh, just running water or whatever, I'll run it in one side of my sink with the dish pan, and that way I can conserve the water, water my plants, or do anything instead of just pouring it down the drain. All right, stopped up drain. You will, when you start canning, you will have stopped up drains. Periodically run hot water with some degreasing dishwashing detergent down the drain to keep it unclogged. It's not a matter of if but when. A small crank snake from the hardware store is better and usually quicker than chemicals. All right, Rebel Canning Group, that's on Facebook. It's highly recommended for both the season and new canners if you're on Facebook. And Rose Red Homestead, Red Rose Homestead on YouTube. She's a professor. Professor, She is interesting. I love Old Alabama Gardener. And if the, and we're on the 100 now, dropped, if the, your pressure dropped while you're pressure canning, if by accident the canner gauge drops b below the recommended pressure or the jiggler, jiggler quits jiggling, you go, oh, no, now what? Stop the timer and begin from the beginning. Use your discretion. Some people, what they do is they stop. They go all the way back. What I do is I look at when it stopped doing that, I look at the time and just basically get it back up to time. And that gap right there, I just don't count as time. Does that make sense? So that way, if it stopped, you're, you're 10 minutes into canning and you still got whatever to go i stop it on that 10 minutes get it back up to pressure and then say start again because that will happen don't worry about it if it happens just just fix it you know all right you lost the ball while bought water bath canning you're you're canning and everything and you and the same thing is is do it the same way when you're water bath canning just stop that timer start it again Always, when you're opening a canner lid, don't do it like this. You know why? Yes. Always open it away from you. So just make sure, just for safety, you don't want to be burned or anything like that. All right. And we already talked about venting, and that's number 103. And that gives you a good idea of what it gives you uh, of what's going on there. Sanitizing jars for water bath canning. Some say jars must be sanitized and others say that hand washing or dishwasher is all you need to do. The main thing is they, they are clean. However, most of you will be heating up the food for water bath canning anyway, so always remember hot food, hot, jar, hot jars to prevent breakage. There are two ways to heat up those jars. And you can also can't, uh, make sure they're sanitized at the same time. Place the jars in the oven and heat to 200 degrees for 15 or 20 minutes. Or number two, place jars in the canner while the water is heating to a boil and let them boil to sanitize. If removing from the hot water, tilt the jar to the side and pour the, with the jar lifter to pour out the water. This is the time you do tilt it because it will be full of water. So take the jar lifter, tilt it to the side, pour out that water, okay? That's the way to get that out if you do that, like this. And then you place it on your towel. Be ready to put your funnel into your jar to fill, to begin to fill, okay? All right. Always place a towel on the side of the stove and place the hot jars on the towel. All right. Sanitizing 
and seedy water versus any other water seedy water you know it's got the chlorine in it if you use like well water or anything like that you know if you use uh bleach with it you're probably good if not then i recommend absolutely to sanitize your jars okay sanitizing jars for pressure canning St standard protocol these days is if you're pressure canning you don't have to sanitize your jars but they must be clean cleaning be done by washing so you can do that by you can put them in the and also you can put those other jars in the dishwasher and everything and they'll be hot too i forgot about that but that's good just as well for uh, for your water bath as well as uh canning so emergency number 107 emergency issue with the water if for some reason there's an issue with the city water boil the jars lid rings or some uh, use some bleach to sanitize them and rinse with water prior to filling so sanitizing lids and rings it's recommended that that modern lids should not be boiled or simmered pri prior to lidding you may feel better placing them in hot tap water in a pan just to warm them up so you won't shock the jars eating straight out of the jar you canned all this beautiful stuff do you want to open it up and eat straight out of it when the food is being pressure canned according to recipe, you can eat the food directly out of the jar. Salt. Iodized salt. Iodized salt can be used, but it may make the product cloudy. And that's in pickles, something clear like that. You'll go, what is wrong with them? But it's not harmful. It just makes it cloudy. It's the iodine. If it's a brine, it will make the brine.